do things to you. Scrambles are going to happen. It's going to be chaos. We see it in other sports like team sports, American football, rugby, stuff like that. It's a slightly more controlled because there's a break after the tackle or whatever. There's a break in it and it doesn't continue on. But wrestling, jiu-jitsu, judo, stuff like this, scrambles happen and they can t- continue happening for a long period of time. It's one of those things where you need to be strong and you need to be secure and you need to be uh, resilient physically in as many different positions and ranges of motion as you could possibly be. Hello, friends. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Main Idea Podcast, where today I have the pleasure of sitting down with the legendary Dan Strauss. Please let me say a brief note about new show sponsors. The show is now brought to you by Athletic Greens, Bubs Naturals, and Vivo Barefoot Shoes, all of which are key components to my daily health, wellness, and fitness routine. To support the show, you can use the links in the show notes or on my Instagram, which will provide various discounts for each of the above brands. Regarding sponsors, I want the listener to know that any brand or sponsorship you hear about on the show will have been personally vetted by me, utilized consistently, and put through the test of jiu-jitsu, strength training, and surfing prior to being invited on as a show sponsor. I do this so that I can share these tools enthusiastically in hopes that they help you optimize your health because the healthier you are and the less pain you're managing, the more you can enjoy life. The other way you can support the show is by taking 30 seconds and leaving a five-star review on Apple or Spotify and subscribing to the YouTube. This helps the show get discovered organically and helps me continue to bring on amazing guests. For your convenience, there's also now timestamps in the show notes, so feel free to jump around to the part that interests you most, although I always recommend listening to the episode in its entirety. Dan Strauss, also known as the Raspberry Ape, is a jiu-jitsu black belt under 10-time world champion Hodger Gracie. He is an ADCC, EBI, Polaris, and Quintet veteran with a knack for strength training, grip work, and training concepts that, in my opinion, every listener can benefit from. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Without further ado, Dan, the Raspberry Ape, Strauss. Dan, thank you so much for being here, man. I know that there's plenty of grip work that you could be doing in place of this. So taking time away from that to be on the show, uh, (laughs) it really means a lot, man. Thank you for being here. My absolute pleasure. I mean, who's to say that I can't be doing grip work whilst uh, chatting to you? You could have a rice bucket (laughs) underneath the desk. I mean, if we're being honest, that's true. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, You know, it's hard. uh, These kind of conversations, uh, like I alluded to before, they're my absolute favorite because I've been an athlete and a, a personal trainer my whole life. And coming into much, much later than you, but finding jujitsu and really falling in love with it and the, the technique and how much it involves your brain and your body and everything coming together. But I'm also just a nerd for like the weird <laughs> kind of nuance strength training and, and where you can depart from the conventional. And in preparation, I've been watching these videos of uh, you just kind of like going through your home gym and really uh, show, showcasing mm. this collection, al- almost like someone who collects medieval swords and mm. axes and maces. You have so much grip specific items as, <laughs> as he displays actual medieval sword. Fantastic. This is going to go great. Uh, <laughs> when did you start to develop a knack for the odd mm. and the unconventional in strength training? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I I got in the strength training many years ago now, maybe 15 years ago or so. And uh, the avenue that I got into strength training through was through Brooks Kubik and dinosaur training. And the idea, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but essentially the idea of the dinosaurs, of the Bible to me, uh, the idea of the dinosaurs in, in dinosaur training is the old time strongman. So that was, for me, the main inspiration for my training as I started off. And unconventional, unorthodox is such an interesting term because it's completely relative, right? right. The, stu- the stuff that we do, uh, the stuff that would be considered for 99% of the gym population to be traditional or classic or normal would be considered highly bizarre 
uh, <laughs> to people a hundred years ago, right? So like a leg press machine. <laughs> Leg press machine. I mean, pec pec deck and all of yeah. this stuff. I mean, this 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 stuff is what I consider unconventional. People say, right. but I, I I'm I'm self aware enough to know that I am in the minority with the stuff that I'm doing. Right. But genuinely, I still have that feeling of what is normal and what is not normal. And for me, what is normal is sandbags, stones, crazy grip attachments. And to, for me, what is bizarre is actually going to. Uh, you know, a, a commercial gym. When I travel, I have to, recently I was traveling a lot around the the north of the UK and I was having to go to the commercial gyms and, you know, seeing bench presses and I know bench yeah. presses kind of, but but seeing all of these machines and weird exit, you know, that, that for me is unorthodox or unconventional. So yeah, the way that I got into it was originally through uh, the old time strongman training. Uh, a lot of the exercises that I still do and would be considered unconventional, unorthodox, but are just way earlier than the traditional exercises that we do now. Uh, and then I kind of just got more into it. And I'm just like you, a bit of a nerd about strength yeah. stuff. And I'm a, a bit of a collector. It's just it, whatever I do, whatever, it, whether it's strength training things or whether it's books or whether it's uh, teas or whatever it is, whatever I'm doing. I have a bad habit of wanting to collect a lot of them. Uh, and that's how the <laughs> that's how the, the, the cave started and grew and continues to grow to this day. It is interesting when you think about just the demands that the world places on us. Mm. And if you're not living a sedentary office life where you get in your car, you drive to work, you take an elevator to your office, you sit in your chair and you do your thing and then you take an mm. elevator home and, uh, you know, you actually look at like what what skills do you need to be a human to actually function out in the world? And you need like... You need your bottom of your feet to be pretty strong to have stability so that it goes up the chain to your knee and your hip. Mm -hmm. And then you need to be able to hold and carry shit in your arms or above your head. And like if you can do those things in some combination, then you're probably going to live a pretty pain-free, injury-free good life. But then you actually look at how people live and to your exact point about this like conventional, non non-conventional, you go to a gym like... And I, I, I almost hate to like knock it because I really do respect that people are taking the risk and they're going out there and they're trying to live a healthier life. And for a lot of people, just getting in the door is the hardest thing they'll ever do. Mm. It's very unlike, you know, you and I live and eat this 24 seven. Mm. Um, but you're not gonna ever sit in a chair and isolate extension in your quad to do something that is gonna improve that moment of your life, right? It's just not a, a thing. Lie in your stomach and curl your heels to your butt. There's places where these things make sense, but in the actual functionality of day-to-day -day life, it's quite the contrary. And if you look at things like like that massive cannonball that you have in your gym that you yeah. can hang and hold, if you've never done that before, you don't really truly understand how much more difficult that is than mm. like a traditional pull-up. Yeah. And these, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think a big part of that is... Uh, I think that uh, commercial gyms are built around one goal, which is with 99% of people probably who go to a commercial gym, the goal is not to actually be healthier and not to necessarily be much stronger, but to look better. And I think that's the, one of the separations that we have. And uh, one of the interesting things, again, I, uh, to, to go back to the old time strongman stuff, they that there was a much less divorce between looking good and functioning and performing optimally. These are guys who were incredibly strong. You know, Eugene Sandow, for example, considered the godfather of bodybuilding, incredible physique, you know, pre-steroid era, very low percent body fat, excellently proportioned. I mean, they still, I believe it's at the, the, the uh, Mr. Olympia. I think they win the, mm -hmm. the, the, the Sandow's. The actual trophy is Eugene Sandow's body. It's one of the big tournaments. I don't know if it's bodybuilding or strongman there. Um, but this, this is someone who was the grandfather of bodybuilding, yet he was also one of the strongest men, uh, you know, certainly weight to ratio that ever lived. So I think back in the past, there was a less of a divorce from performance and aesthetics. I think nowadays, a lot of people actually don't really care that much how strong they are and they care more about how they look. And I think that's why we have the prevalence of these machines that maybe don't help us uh, as functional as some other exercises do. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at grappling sports too, how just the training volume, like to be competitive, the amount that you have to constantly be training, right? So mm. cardiovascularly, you're always 
expelling effort, but also physically there's a ton of isometric work and grip work and exchanges, whether it's in the gi or out of the gi. Wrestling exchanges are super metabolically demanding. And what you get out of this is a body type that actually looks like it moves well through space, but it's mm. actually aesthetically kind of what a lot of people are after anyway. So you get this uh, kind of beast of a person that's a product of just f actually moving. Yet people are trying to pursue that th through these, well, I guess, more conventional methods. Mm. It's kind of funny how there, there's no alignment there. Yeah, I mean, the, the jiu-jitsu body shape one is interesting because, of course, jiu-jitsu, like many sports with uh, weight divisions, means that you can have really different body shapes within the same weight. You can mm -hmm. have tall, skinny guys, and you can have short, stocky guys competing against each other in the s same weight divisions. I mean, in terms of the physique of a lot of grapplers, uh, I mean, some of the top guys do not look like they're physical specimens in any way, shape, or form. A lot of the guys who look like physical specimens have a lot of assistance, uh the the you know i knew he'd talk about this at some it, point it, if you know what i mean <laughs> i remember watching uh some of the training when i was first getting into um you know getting serious about tra strength training stuff and i watched i think it was maybe on art suave or one of the other um or, and, and i've seen in the past of a very high level um very powerful like renowned for renowned for their strength grappling athletes and then i watched their training i'm like this training is terrible and I think Their that's strength another, training. Yeah, I think this is yeah. another thing that um, that uh, steroids can do, is it can just basically gloss over a bad program because you're going to get stronger, mm -hmm. you're going to get bigger, you're going to put on muscle by simply doing essentially anything. I mean, if you take steroids, you will literally put on muscle without exercising. This is the thing that people don't. They, they've done experiments. When your testosterone goes up that much, you actually will build muscle. I mean, there's going to be. You're not going to look like uh, Ronnie Coleman. Uh, without exercising, but your 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 muscle mass and your strength will increase if you sit at home and you do nothing. That's the crazy thing about it. Uh, so then, with just kind of doing any exercise at all, you're gonna start to get these crazy physiques. So I think it's a combination. I think uh, jujitsu and I think wrestling's different. There's still a lot of steroids in wrestling, of course, but wrestling's different in that the you 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 don't really see a single wrestler who doesn't look like a fucking beast. Uh, what, do you think that's because of the stalling nature of, of jiu-jitsu or like how, you, you know, you see a lot of top matches, right? I mean, actually, this happened in, in your Polaris match with AJ, is that you can sit down, right? At some yeah. point, you can decide to take the match to the floor and then you can command the entire thing from there and, and mm -hmm. really operate an offense from your butt. You can't do that in wrestling. Like yep. every, so d physically, the sport itself it's not that it's harder because there's other things about jujitsu that are more difficult than wrestling, but it's oh, that I'd say constant. It's, I'd upright. say it's physically harder. I think yeah. you'd struggle to deny that phys that judo and wrestling are physically hard. Uh, you know, they, they simply are physically harder than jujitsu is, uh, which is why their rounds are so much shorter because they are so much more physically demanded. I don't think that's a controversial. It's not. A, it's not a slight on jujitsu. Uh, right. But it's just a it's just a different sport, and and jujitsu is moving a lot more towards that stuff. It's becoming the people are becoming more ath athletic, and it is becoming more explosive. But just by a function of the rules, uh, judo and 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 wrestling, uh, freestyle or, or Greco Roman is going to be more explosive than jujitsu is. But I don't think that's the sole reason. I don't think the sport itself necessarily is the reason for a, such a big difference in the physical characteristics of the athletes. I think that. In and and again, this is changing. Jiu-Jitsu is such a new sport, um, but in more established sports such as judo and certainly wrestling, they train from a really young age. All of the guys that you see right. at the top level have been training since the, you know they were three or four years old, so their body has adapted with wrestling. They have become literally wrestling machines. I, I think it was Daniel Lieberman, uh, story of the human body that talks about uh you, you you know the 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 aging and growth process and as you get through puberty basically you're born as a robot that has the ability to adapt into any scenario or environment you know because some humans live in really really hot countries and some people and some humans live in really really cold countries and some people right. live in places uh where it rains a lot and some people uh, live in places where it's super high altitude and all of these different things and 
if all humans were built the same, we wouldn't know what environment, you know, that you wouldn't adapt particularly well as you grow. So there's right. this stage uh, sort of pre-puberty where your body is adapting to its stimulus, which is why it's such an important thing to get kids active, to get kids running, to get them jumping. This is where the the the, the um, bone structure starts to come in, all of this stuff. So yeah. when you have people doing a really high intensity sport such as wrestling from a really young age, sort of from that four, five, six year old to and through puberty, you have created a, 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 an, a physical grappling machine, wrestling machine, that they'll continue to be until the day that they die. It's just part of the growing process. So I think the fact that a lot of top jiu-jitsu athletes, uh, it, obviously it's going to be changing as jiu-jitsu gets old, you know, as, as, as jiu-jitsu is much bigger now. So a lot of the top right. people who are coming through Relutos or, uh, you, you know, um, a lot of the other youngsters that are coming through that are super high level, they've been grappling since they were kids. I think we're going to see more of a, uh, more impressive physiques in jiu-jitsu the more that we go through. Um, so yeah, that's the the second reason, and also the the other one is that there's a big culture of physical conditioning and preparedness in both judo and especially wrestling. When you wrestle, you're expected to run, you're expected to lift, you're expected to do all these things. Whereas in jiu-jitsu, because of the marketing of jiu-jitsu early days, that it was yeah. a small guy can beat the big guy. Um, even though all of these Gracies in the early days were absolutely doing their strength and conditioning. I mean, Gracie's been the plenty of Gracie's been popped for steroids. Uh, all of these guys. I mean, Hicks seems to be Gra a trend in the sport lately. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, how long ago was Hoist popped for steroids? That was like it's going to age me, but it's like over yeah. fi probably fifteen years ago. It was a really long time ago. That was still Pride era. Um, so like over ten years ago, pretty much for sure. Uh, so um, yeah, we don't have that physical culture. Uh, we don't have that 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 physical trend as part of the culture. That's really interesting what you said about the the early days marketing because it's very true. Like the the small guy can beat the big guy. The self defense approach. The you don't need to be strong to be good at jujitsu. And then also, I mean, there are there are many instances in which a stronger person is reminded of the truth of some of that. That you can really be out out positioned or out technique by someone smaller, and they can win in the exchange. But, but that's true sport, of everything, right? Totally. And true, as true, sport, true of judo, sport. true of wrestling, true of all of these stuff. But the rest is still stuff. You still got to be a fucking animal, though. You know. And they ingrain that at. 100%. I mean, I think of like you know in the U.S. like pop Warner football or something like that. Like you're you see kids in in pads that are three times as big as they are. Right? They're they're barely old enough to run, but they're doing suicide sprints and hot laps around. You don't see that yet in the jiu jitsu academy. And that mm. will you're right, that will change the culture 100%. Do you do you feel like on the on the ha having competed at the highest level mm. within the sport? What are your thoughts on on steroids, steroid use, the incentives for the athlete to take them, who they are or are not helping? Um like who should be to blame for using them? Should we change the rule set to open it up because they're going to do it any other way? Like what are your thoughts on on that and maybe the mm -hmm. risks that are imposed upon you the athlete competing against someone who is or isn't using mm. yeah it's a good question it's uh it's a quite a, a hot topic in jiu-jitsu over the last couple of years especially i mean over the last six months it's been kind of really exploded people have been a lot more open and talking about it um it's definitely a big issue <clears throat> and uh i think steroids are an issue uh just worldwide I think with Instagram culture, a lot of, uh, I mean, it's always been something that's happened, but I think with the internet and with Instagram and stuff like that and people being shoved in their face, these incredible, unrealistic physiques day in, day out, thinking that they can look like that and realizing that they, these guys are on steroids and then they have to take those as well. But speaking specifically about jujitsu, you have to, you know, when we talk about jujitsu culturally, uh, Brazil... People need to people who are from Europe or parts of Europe, like the UK where I am, or America, uh, that from the states, they need to understand how big a difference the culture of steroids and performance enhancing drugs is in Brazil. It's not a thing like it is for us. You can just go to the pharmacy and just buy it over the counter. You, oh, it, you mean in terms of accessibility? Absolutely. Yeah. It 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 really is not seen as a big that. deal. It it, yeah. it is very very different. So. 
when you watch even early days of ADCC, these guys are fucking jacked and they're all juiced yeah. up, <laughs> you know? So, so the question is, is it getting worse? Probably not. It's probably just been the same throughout. I don't know. I think it's getting to the point now where now people are talking about it, where a lot of maybe younger athletes are essentially being told, you only st- if you want to be ADCC champion... You better get on the gear and do it quickly. And that's the that's the worrying thing. In terms of the risks, everyone knows the risks with steroids. But no one gives a shit. You think a 23-year-old guy who all he live he eats, sleeps, and breathes jujitsu, he trains three times a day, he doesn't want anything else in his life apart from winning ADCC. You think he gives a shit that he might die when he's 50? I didn't give a Absolutely shit. Absolutely not. I mean, I didn't do stories, but I wouldn't give it. Like when I was in my early twenties, I, I didn't care. If someone told me you, you win ADCC, but you'll die when you're fifty, I go, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. To be honest with you, there's this right. uh, this single mindedness and this laser focus and this immaturity, um, but but that comes with youth in 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 many different ways, where the risks are longevity and top these guys don't care about longevity if you want to be a world champion of sport longevity is a very difficult thing for you to reach with or without steroids right Right. because you've got to train super hard you know i trained super hard when i was in my teens and in my 20s and i and 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 i train i can't train as hard as i used to because the body starts to fall apart a little bit i'm only in my early 30s i mean i can still train but what i'm going to be like in my mid 40s is going to be is probably probably not going to be super fun and i'm not training like these kids are training now so longevity is already difficult without you start putting stuff like performance enhancing drugs into the mix as well. So uh, in terms of the risks, no one, none of these kids who are trying to be ADCC champion are going to see, oh, well, you might take a few years off of your life or you might not be in a good way when you're older. That's like telling them... You know, it's telling someone uh, who's in their 90s to worry about global warming. They just don't, I mean, it's hard right. for them to care, right? You know, you're 90 years old, you don't have any kids, you're kind of fed up with the world and you say, oh, in 500 years, the, 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 you know, you know the, the, <laughs> the, the, sea levels are gonna, the sea levels are going to be gone. And you go, I don't give a shit. I'm not worried about that. So I think that's one of the issues that we have, which is maybe this idea that they're necessary, yeah. which I don't think they are, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, it seems know. that there's, I mean, there's people that are, that reach great heights that do it naturally. It can be done. I mean, right right now, like uh, Isaac Dodolin just went like back to back championships, as as we know, as a national ath- uh, natural athlete, it can be done. Then you have guys that won't compete in IBJJF because they know there's testing, and they choose to compete in untested sports, and they look like they've been cut from the side of a mountain. Hundred so, percent. You know, and and you're right. Like the the incentives at a young age, the younger the sport gets, the less you will think big picture because you're an absorbed young athlete. And what do you want to do? Like when you're younger, you only want the world. You want you think Olympic gold medal, number one, sign a big contract, get into an organization. Like you're not looking at it from the perspective of the bystander going, "Hey guys, this is kind of really risky for their mm-hmm. health." Why would you consider that? So exactly. then if you look right and this guy's doing it and you look left and that guy's doing it, what is there to incentivize you to forego it? And then you're seeing the results. Like, I mean, I'm so I just turned 34 and I've been training since I was 14 in some capacity all over different mm. sports. Right. And I, I absolutely it drives me crazy to admit this. I really have a hard time to admit mm. it, but it is harder to train at a high intensity consistently today than it was eight years ago oh of course night and day yeah. i mean the ability to go you could go strength training in the morning tr- grappling in the middle of the day and then another session at night and you could mm. wake up the next morning you do it again on a fraction of the sleep that you mm-hmm. need now and the reality is it, it changes like it's hard and you're young at heart because you're doing this shit right you're in your gym working out you're surrounded by people that are pushing themselves you're not a 30 year old surrounded by other 30 year olds that don't do shit Mm. that are lazy, that, that have a sedentary lifestyle and office job. So when you start to feel that part of you slide, it's fucking hard, man. It all, it's like mentally kind of draining sometimes. Bro, we've got 40s to look forward to. 
<laughs> and, we, and we got TRT and all that shit, right? I think did you did you ever feel of boys, baby? <laughs> did you ever feel temptation when you were competing? Was did there you know? like shit? I'm all, I love strength training. I'm already strong. I'm a freak athlete. I'm grinding my gears 24 seven to be better at this sport that only a fraction of the world watches. Why yeah. not gear up? Do you know what it was? Is is uh, I just felt that I had to train harder. It was it was frustrating because I'd hmm. see people who were basically getting the same results or better, and I knew that they weren't training as hard as me. I knew that they weren't lifting as hard. I knew that they weren't killing themselves as much, um, and that's frustrating. Uh, but then at the end of the day, like longevity is something that's important to me, um, and I just thought that you know I'd rather I'd I'd rather I'd rather take the long route. What do you do now for longevity? Like when you think about that, what does longevity mean to you? Uh, I, I guess the biggest difference is, and I still lift heavy, but I don't kill myself with the weights as much as I used to. So like uh, I've just started uh, back squatting again, um, which I haven't for a long time. I've been doing a lot of bag squatting stuff in front of, and other variations of squats. Just started back squatting again, running 5-3-1. And... Uh, Whereas before my goal was, you know, 200 kilo plus, that's like 440 plus. Yeah. Um, I, d I, d I have zero, you know, I, 200 <laughs> is not a goal that I'd like to hit. You know, I'd be happy with yeah. 30, 40, 50 pounds less because I realized the diminishing returns that you get on the functional strength. And this year, unless you're competing in powerlifting, the returns yeah. that you're getting on that are so diminished and it is killing your joints a little bit when you start putting your body under that much pressure all the time so um just being a little bit smarter understanding that i'd rather have a f more well-rounded strength uh than just trying to push a single aspect i was always under this impression that strength was very much and strength don't get me wrong strength is absolutely an attribute but the but the way that you would measure your that strength attribute would be your deadlift your back squat your bench yep. press those are the only ways that you can measure it. And someone and 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 someone goes, "This guy's super strong." And you go, "Was he? Was he bench? Oh, he right. benches. Uh, he benches two hundred and twenty pounds. That's not a lot. Like that guy can't be strong." And then I realized, because I got to the stage where I couldn't bench much, I couldn't squat much, I couldn't deadlift much, but I was stronger than I was back then. You know, mm. because I could pick up a sandbag or I could. Yeah pull this weight on a pull up or I could carry this you know so uh strength is certainly an attribute but it's not as simply defined as these three arbitrary lifts such as squat bench and deadlift that we need to push to the absolute max like we're going to compete in powerlifting well and they also don't have uh, you mentioned functional application earlier but that's a big part of this like if you're on say jujitsu for example how much does a back squat serve you and where does it serve you? So let's say that you're a, let's say you're a, I'm not good with kilos, but let's say you're like an 80 kilo person Yep. and you can back squat. Let's, let's put you up there in strength and you can do like double your body weight Yep. or two and a half times your body weight. Is that margin, the extra one and a half better than just doing the one? Like if you could mm -hmm. squat your body weight for 15 reps at 80 kilos, or you could do half of that at, one and a half times your body weight, what are you actually going to be able to utilize on the mats? What are you actually going to be able to utilize when someone's driving against you and you're driving against the floor to try to do an arm drag to a single leg or a double leg or something? And that is something that I feel like the sport is so... Wrestling's been around a, lo a long time and judo a long time. But when you look at jujitsu, there haven't been many studies where they actually look at like, what is the peak athlete doing mm. where they can taper the strength that they've built and put it into an application in a live setting? Because it's hard. Something like a sandbag carry where you lift up mm. and you move it across the room and drop it, that visually to me looks way more useful. Mm. But to the lifter themselves, that's it might not be fun, right? Or you're not like grinding out some fucking back squat, blowing mm. your disc in half and your knees in half. And so you're not as strong as you were, but you're way more functionally strong. Yeah. But yeah. it's hard to wrap your head around and appreciate that as an athlete. Yeah, it's difficult. And, uh, you know, it's it's one of the biggest changes in uh, 
sort of training philosophy that I've had over my journey. There was a time where I only cared about, you know, what, what numbers can you put up on a straight bar? And then for many years, I never touched a straight bar in any a a exercise at all. Um, and maybe my, I mean, like, for example, now I just started back squatting again. My back squat's not good, but I'm not weak. <laughs> you know, I may be right. weak <laughs> on back squat and that's what it comes down to. And, 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 and having like throwing, it's difficult to throw out numbers is what it is because, and, and and there's something that I've not put a huge amount into, like deciding what that point of diminishing returns is where you're like, well, two times body weight's good, but 2.5 is <laughs> probably unnecessarily too much. And three times yeah. is really unnecessary. You know, you're going to the amount of work that you're putting in. Uh, but you're right. You know, the, the, the theory that I always had was, well, if I can squat 200 kilos, I am strong because a weak person cannot stroke, cannot squat 200 kilos. And it's not wrong. That's not wrong. You can't, you, you, no one who, is too, who can squat 200 kilos uh, is a weak person. It would be impossible for you to describe them as that. But you could also say um, anyone who can carry a 140 kilo sandbag 10 meters is not a weak person. You could right. tell anyone who can do um, a 50 kilo pull up is not a weak person. You know, you, 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 can, you can say all of these other exercises. So I think it's trying to, find the level of strength in many different ranges and in many different positions um and 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 bringing all of those up so they can be strong together instead of having them strong at the expense of others when you're training how much of your time is spent uh adhering to some sort of program design and how much of it is spent like exploring or playing around yeah, and I I'd say playing around uh, for people listening, um, playing around with intention, not not like just randomly, but exploring a range of motion and seeing how much strength you can actually get through that. But like how much do you allot for playtime and creation mm -hmm. and how much do you allot for like really structured, periodized programming? Yeah, good question. And, and the answer to that question is it really changes from time to time. So as of last week, uh, so I was away for... Uh, two months traveling, uh, doing seminars and stuff like that. Uh, and when I came back from that, I was really interested in, you know, training very hard. And so I, I've tightened my training up a lot. So I'm in like session four was today. Uh, I'm in week two of running what I would consider. I, I haven't uh, had the time to sit down and probably write all out, but a structured program, a very, very structured program with minimal time for fucking about for lack of a better word right. exploration <laughs> as you might play might be a more better <laughs> word um but there's been other times where i think again it's all about balance where if you have too much play and exploration you'll you'll never progress forward there's still sort of scientific rules of training where if you want to get stronger at something there must be progressive overload over time so you right. always have to have that as part of what you're doing so you can't come in and have a different workout every single week otherwise uh it might be really fun and you never get bored but you're not really getting that much stronger on anything um so you need that i've always had a core exercise so basically um what i would have is a core exercise for all the days that i was training and i'd always be trying to increase my strength so either increase the reps i was doing the sets that i was doing or the weight that i was doing and then have um some other core accessory work and then I'd have leave time for myself at the end to basically do whatever I felt like that time and in, in, in that day. Um, and then in terms of proper, proper play and exploration, maybe uh, on other days or when I had some free time, I would be doing a, a non-serious training day. And I'd go in and I'd just play around and explore and try different things out. Uh, but it but it changes time to time. And I think there's there's times where you need a more strict program or you can schedule in play. You know, yeah. as long as you tick the other boxes of what you're doing, then there can be room for those things. Now, some people would tell you, uh, I know you'll hear lots of lots of trainers say, stick to the program, cut the bullshit, <laughs> don't do this. And go, yeah, but fucking where's life? And you go, yeah, you, you know what? If I if I didn't if I didn't leave myself any time for exploration or play or fucking about, then maybe I would be two percent better. But at what yeah. cost? Right. And at, at, at the enjoy, cost of at enjoying enjoyment. my training. Totally. I mean, there's, 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 in the same way that we leave room in a diet for some ice cream, 
yeah. and pizza, <laughs> whatever your vice is, there, it says a lot about each other. Right, right. More of an ice cream guy. Or both, right? Or both, um, if you're having a good night. Um, but in the same way we leave a little bit of room for that in our diet, we should leave a little bit of room for that in our training as well. Yeah, it's interesting always talk like talking to people who've actually dedicated a big portion of their life to it. Understanding what strength is. I don't I don't mean just getting stronger because of the point that you alluded to a moment ago, if you really define strength as rep max, then there's a couple ways that you can test it and you mm. you know as someone who's invested time into doing this that it takes as the better you get at it, it takes progressively more effort to get a exactly. marginal increase. So exactly. if your squat is strong and you're the strongest you've ever been, for you to get an extra two kilos on a max effort lift to go from 100 to 108%, that could be a five, six month journey, mm -hmm. honestly. And you're managing your recovery, you're managing injuries, you're down regulating other training frequency, mm -hmm. a shit that you like to do, or time with family. Like it really does become uh, to some degree an addiction and also a time investment. So it's fun to hear from people that have done this for so long how much they you purposely kind of let the wheels fall off in a way because you see the value of the play and mm -hmm. i always think about it like it kind of trips me out because life is not a programmed thing ever and even in something that you can prepare for whether it be uh, a tournament or or something something with a dynamic element so not mm -hmm. like a strongman competition because that is very much like a bottleneck uh, you can prepare in all the capacities that you want you can still just lose Mm. because the other person had a better day or something like that. And if you're not enjoying training and it's an additional stress onto your life, that's not a good thing either because stress, that'll break you down. You won't sleep as well. You won't recover as well. And now you're really starting to take it out of you. Mm. Did you feel like through, through your competitive journey and maybe even now like going around doing seminars and still training, was there a point where you realized you had to put a value on recovery outside of your training demands yeah i think everyone learns that the hard way to be honest with you i think when it gets to i think everyone does i really do i think blew the, my back out yeah i mean i've been there back shoulders everything you know knees um your body will tell you eventually it will tell you when it when it when it tell, it, it will tell you what it needs and um a lot of the time what it needs is for you to stop being such an idiot and for, for <laughs> prioritizing all order other, yeah priori it is prioritizing things other than performance um it, it reminds me i think it was uh i think it's hackenschmidt's uh quote which is uh strength cannot be divorced from health or something along those lines uh and it's a really important one which is in order to be strong you have to be healthy and health is a uh, very holistic idea um and that is your eating your sleeping your breathing your recovery your relationships you know mm -hmm. every single thing that you do within your life uh t t done in a way that is as healthy as possible it's all going to work holistically for you to be able to perform to your max and i think that you can have w w when it is when strength is divorced from health or health is divorced from strength i think that you can have sm you can have uh high performance but it's very limited and at some point that's going to that's going to run out and some people may be luckier than others they may just have way better genetics or a way better pharmacist but at some point <laughs> that's going to run out i don't want to keep talking I about steroids though yeah right yeah let's circle back there we, we can sound like i'm being really it'll bitchy be, about it'll be it. fun, I, don't yeah. care, I don't care that much <laughs> <laughs> who's your favorite steroid user uh <laughs> if you 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 injured your back right pretty uh, bad uh -huh. how did that happen and then what what adjustments did you have to make in your jujitsu training and then also your strength training when that happened hmm. so my back injury is a very long story and i'll try and summarize it as best i can uh but i injured my back um 11 years ago now, when I was 21. Um, and long story short, what it turned out to be is to be a, a, a spinal injury and a disc injury and uh, other stuff to do with the back. With back injuries, it's all of, it sort of doesn't matter what it is because uh, different people can have similar or very different um, injuries. Uh, it, it depends on how they're 
body is reacting to that and how they're coping with it. So like, what is the functionality? And my functionality was relatively low. It was certainly not as bad as some people with back injuries, but it was it was pretty bad. It was affecting my training in a big way. Um, it, I would, was it, uh, it was a lumbar issue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. L5S1, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, a pretty standard one. Yeah, and, it's like the uh, most popular. That's it. Oh, everyone's got yeah. that one. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, whenever someone tells me they injured the back, I go, L5S1? They go, what? How'd you know? <laughs> yeah, that's it's the only vertebrae I know. <laughs> absolutely. It's everyone. Uh, so, yeah, it, it affected my training in a big way. It affected my life in a big way. Uh, for many years, uh, like, uh, I'd say a year and a half of or maybe two years of sort of an acute reaction and then into a chronic uh, where I would get flare-ups. Uh, it affected my jiu-jitsu in a way where, you know, if I was in a flare-up, I basically couldn't train or I couldn't train for a very long time. Um, I got pretty close, to be honest with you. Um, I had a shoulder injury as well uh, that sort of a little bit later on. There was a labrum tear, but I didn't know for a long time, and I trained through it, and it, it was flaring up and giving me terrible trouble. I got pretty close to, to, to ch- throwing the towel in, to be honest with you. Only ever once in my life did I consider walking away from jiu-jitsu, um, and, 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 and it was... It was in the month leading up to the Agazan fight on Polaris 2. Mm-hmm. And uh, the fight went so well, sort of, as a boost to my, you know, it was a very exciting fight and it was a big boost of my popularity and it allowed me to really get into jiu-jitsu properly. And then soon afterwards I had surgery and my shoulder was fixed. And that's kept me in the game ever since. But, but uh, yeah, so, so flare-ups would be bad. Um uh, I, in terms of my physical training, what I realized was that I couldn't do anything hinging. Mm-hmm. I could, so I couldn't deadlift, I couldn't row, but I could squat yeah. and I could bench and I could do pull up. So those were the exercises that I did and they kept me as strong as you, but you know, like I said before, if you ju- if you asked me if I was strong and I said, yeah, and you said, well, what'd you deadlift? I tell you 50 kilograms. You tell <laughs> me what I could bench 150 kilograms, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, uh, just going back to that, what is strength? Um, and then the crazy thing about the back injury where it's at the point now where do I still have, do I, is it still there? Yeah, it is. But to be honest, my back is probably not far off of what a normal 32 year old's back is like, to be honest with you, you know, whereas I expected when I injured my back when I was 21, I thought, well, by the time I'm 32, I won't be walking probably. Uh, but I had a massive, um, regain of functional, uh, uh, use of the back crazily enough and if you told me that this is going to be because the the thing that was that fucked me up was hinging so i said i could squat 200 kilos but if you threw uh 20 coins on the ground and told me to pick them up individually i'd be fucked uh and what fixed my back actually was lifting stones and sandbags from the ground i would never have believed you in a thousand years if that's what you told me uh, but but that's that's how I recovered my back first from beginning to train for the dinny stones because I felt that with the handles these are two big stones with handles on and 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 yep. I could I could lift them without hinging my back because you kind of straddle the position and what I realized and I was doing it from a heightened position to how they would actually be but I worked out quite heavy and my back was feeling really good like longer it better than it had felt I in mean a long that's time. like extremely counterintuitive but the more i think about it that comes back to being the intuitive. position with which you lift a stone off the ground is much different than the leverage point for a deadlift and so it's actually more of a vertical spine it's like it, and correct me where i'm wrong here but for stone lifting atlas stones off the ground you need tons of hip flexion mm. ability and thoracic mobility so mm. you need to be upright, but really low to the ground, right? So if so, you can engage, you're actually using all your hips to do yeah. the lifting. So the thing with, so the, the Denny Stone lifting is like a, almost like a trap bar deadlift. Uh, but then oh, wait, one, these are the, yeah. uh, like that, to, to, right? To start yeah. with, to start with. That's what, that's, and then once I was doing that, getting heavy and thinking, this feels mm-hmm. good. Then I started to lift uh, sandbags and stones. Gotcha. Now to lift a sandbag or a stone, the interesting thing with it, because of course the conventional wisdom tells you, how do you fuck up your back? You lift things with a rounded back. It's the biggest no-no. Don't lift things with a rounded back. Well, with a stone, you have no option. You cannot lift a stone with a straight back because it's not a thin little bar. It's a massive mass of either 
a bag with sand in it or a piece of concrete or whatever, uh, 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 something, a uh, part of the earth. So you're forced to take a rounded back position as you lift. Yeah. And for me, this is very much like um, the knees over toes idea, which yeah. is knees over toes in any position is uh, traditionally uh, tried to be avoided because it's a weakened position. But if it's a weakened position, surely you should be stronger there. Yeah. Because if you strengthen the weakness, then everything will be stronger. And I believe that the round back lifting has a similar effect, which is if you learn how to lift in a slightly weaker position, then you're strengthening that weakness. And through sandbag, uh, sandbags and stone lifting, um, I brought my back to what I would consider as close to 100% functionality as I really need it. Well, you can see too, the majority of world record setting deadlifts conventional or sumo they're set with a rounded back position and this is a big misconception in the training industry is that it this is true if someone is brand new to fitness they're never worked out in their life and they've spent their whole life rounding forward and not using their hips to pick up objects it is a very great idea to teach them how to hinge at their hips with a flat back and lift something with their legs mm. but if you're a strong as hell person and you're trying to get stronger you have to learn how to lift with a slightly more rounded spinal position. And then if you look at all the things that they do in strongman competition, mm -hmm. you, you have to mm -hmm. because your whole body has to do the thing. So it's not this isolated, uh, you know, step up to the barbell, get ready. Like this object can move, it can shift, it requires your whole body. I always wonder actually because I started out when I was younger having a very like technically sound from if you were to look at me as an athlete from a profile view it's like a technically perfect deadlift mechanically what you want the hips to do but as i got stronger and stronger in my life not adjusting that sooner started to place more stress on my lumbar and i didn't i didn't address that until eventually i had an event like that where i was laid up on a couch for like a week and a half and then forever since then dealing with it to some degree but it was that moment that then going forward, I had to learn how to make that adjustment to the body. Mm. But it's a hard one to make if you're not familiar with movements. Yeah, I, 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 it, it's a really interesting one. I mean, I've seen a lot of data that shows, I wish I, I, I need to look for the actual study, uh, that basically shows no correlation between injury of discs between round back and straight back lifting, which is really oh, interesting. Uh, but it makes it makes sense to me based on my experience. My biggest, I guess, the summary of this philosophy for myself would be: the big difference is whether you are choosing to round your back, or whether the load is choosing to yeah. round your back for you. Well because said. the way well that said. I f the way that I messed my back up initially was, I was doing heavy bent over row, and my back rounded and 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 it popped. And in that scenario, I was trying to keep my back straight mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I let it go or it forced through me and it rounded. However, when you purposefully round the back or purposefully control and allow some rounding of the back, well, then you're still in control and you're safe. I think that's essentially for me, I bet that's what I believe to be the, 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 the kind of idea behind this. There's also, if you look at jujitsu, like the structure of this, the sport, there's so much time where yep. you're spent, if, especially if you play on the bottom or defensively, where you are getting stacked into a rounded, a forced rounded back position. So if all of your strength is in a straight back position with a certain degree of hip flexion and everything that you do is from there, and now someone, your opponent, is smashing you, to get out of an arm bar or, or, or something or transition and you're on the back of your neck and your legs are in the air and you're rounded into your body. Like that's your, if you can be as strong as you want in the gym on a conventional deadlift. And if yep. that's what's happening in the training hall, you're destined to get hurt at some point because you're not strengthening your body through exactly what you said, which is the weak point. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I think, uh, around back lifting, especially for, uh, you know, controlled round back lifting for grapplers is important because it, there will be no sport in the world, you know, very similar to wrestling. Mm -hmm. I think wrestling is a great example of it, probably even more so because of how dynamic it is. 
bit of MMA, jiu-jitsu, judo, wrestling, stuff like that. There is no sport in the world where you have so little control over where your body will be. Yeah. You know, because you have another person that is going to be trying to twist you up, do things to you. Scrambles are going to happen. It's going to be chaos. We see it in other sports like team sports, American football, rugby, stuff like that. It's a slightly more controlled because there's a break after the tackle or whatever. There's a break in it and it doesn't continue on. But wrestling, jiu-jitsu, judo, stuff like this, scrambles happen and they can t- continue happening for a long period of time. It's one of those things where you need to be strong and you need to be secure and you need to be uh, resilient physically in as many different positions and ranges of motion as you could possibly be. I mean, we can unpack this bag a little bit for those listening that are, you know, maybe they're not competitive to your level, but they're active, consistent hobbyists who train frequently three to four times a week. They love doing this. What is your kind of pecking order of, of things that you really feel the grappler should be doing for longevity, for strength maintenance that might be outside of the wheelhouse of what they would really think about when they think about gym training? Like, what are some things these people should be incorporating or trying to learn about incorporating into the regiment? Yeah, I think uh, I'm gonna give you a really boring answer here, sadly. But I think, uh, but 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 you're the qu- I got to give you what I believe to be the right answer, which is if you don't, if your lifestyle isn't, uh, uh, if your lifestyle isn't conducive to performance, then you're gonna struggle. All of the other stuff is gonna be kind of irrelevant, like what kind of lifting you're doing and all of this stuff. If your food's not good, if your sleep's not good. If all of that stuff is is really bad, then that's more of a priority to look at over, uh, in terms of recovery especially. It, 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 Louder, on, yeah. On, on, <laughs> honestly, like the food, the food is. I'd say sleep is number one. Um, everyone yep. says this, but I had the, I I literally remember the day. I remember the day where I had the true epiphany of the anecdotal experience of the power of sleep, and it was one day I was feeling physically just destroyed. And I sort of, I supplemented with sleep as if I would a performance enhancing drug. I scheduled in 10 hours of sleep, went to bed super early and I wake up the next day and I could not believe how good my body felt. And it was that moment I realized that it wasn't just what people said. It was really, and, and, and the next time you're physically smashed up, try it, dose yourself with sleep. Don't don't people look at sleep as something that they're required to do? No, it's something that we can use. Dose yourself with sleep when you need to, and um, and, and and you'll feel the difference that it makes. So sleep's number one. Nutrition's number two, in my opinion. Um, training smart is very very important. Stuff like I see people. Uh, I mean, this is real white belt stuff, but you'll see some people go a little bit too far with it. But like having this stick up your ass about tapping and training and having your arm hyperextended. I remember saying to a kid who was training with me, one of my students, he would uh, really wait till the very last second in these arm bars. I go, bro, what? So you can, you're not even escaping. You're just taking longer to be tapped. Yeah. You're, and, and in six months, you're, you're going to come to me and you're going to say, I can't move my arms. I can't straighten my elbow. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. So really dumb, avoidable stuff like that. Basically, avoid all damage to the body that is unnecessary. All damage to the body should be completely freak accidents that are completely unavoidable. So don't do stupid stuff like hold on and and, and really be stubborn with submissions because you don't want to attack someone in training. It's just stupid. In terms of other stuff that you're doing, uh, a lot of people say yoga, stretching, and stuff like that. It's been proven that strength training, resistance training is the number one. It is it, it is a far greater factor than any sort of stretching routine for injury prevention. So if yes. you're not doing some sort of strength training, and what people don't understand actually, and this, this is the thing with uh, strength training for grapplers, is that yes, we'll train a lot of exercises that are very applicable to our sport, but not just exercises that are applicable to our sport. Because if you just train exercises that are applicable for our sport, you are purely training for performance. You're not training for recovery or longevity or resilience. And the reason for that is every single sport that you do will follow, even something as varied as jiu-jitsu, will follow a certain uh, pattern of body positions and biomechanics. 
and there'll be stuff that you do more of. So jujitsu, as we you said earlier, is very internally rotated. So shoulders are in, the hips are in, the head is down. It's very much we're, we're we're sort of rounded like a ball the whole time. Well, you'll have other sports that are a lot more open up and a lot more chest out and shoulders back and stuff like that. Uh, and and all the other things that we do in jujitsu, you know, very much, uh, ha you know, hip dominant and at, and all of this stuff. If you only train the exercises that you're training in the gym, then you're going to have, from training jiu-jitsu, muscular imbalances. And yep. then you're going to exacerbate those muscular imbalances by only training those same ranges of motion outside of the jiu-jitsu mats. So you need to have a balanced training that does not only train the positions that or the the ranges of motion and the style and of the biomechanics that we want to improve for jiu-jitsu that is purely for performance and it has a place but you also need to tra train the antagonist of that so we're keeping everything nice and balanced this is one of the most important things with the greatest example really is with the grip stuff um Everyone's, you know, how, how can you train grip so much as you do without having any elbow problems? And I tell them the reason I do not lack elbow problems in spite of my grip training. I lack elbow problems because of my grip training, because I am not training. So in jujitsu, especially in the gi, which is where most people have their issues, it's all yeah. flexion, 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 flexion. So your flexors become very, very tight and very strong and overdeveloped and your extensors have never, ever worked. So then right. you go to the gym and you go, got to get my grip stronger. So you do more flexion. You do captains of crush. You do hand grippers. You do hanging onto yeah. a barbell. You do gi pull-ups and you work those forearms even more. Well, now your elbow is screaming at you because your fore yeah. your flexors are massively overdeveloped and your there's a huge imbalance. So what you should be doing in the gym a little bit of that, don't get me wrong, but more importantly, you should be doing extensor work, be it wrist roller, be it uh, uh, with a band around your hand, be it, you know, all of the other exercises, you know, uh, supination, pronation, all of these things that work the extensor. Yeah. And then that's going to balance out the training that you're doing on the mat. And now you're going to be able to, one, have healthier elbows, wrists, hands, forearms, and two, train your Flex your ex your flexes even more that that grip that you need for jujitsu you can train that even more because now you've got that balance there so that's true not just of grip the grip is the best example and it will be definitely the most important because i get this question every fucking day about people who have tendonitis in their elbows and i give them the same answer um but uh but but that's also an, the that's an important distinction though that i i think people there's a misconception on that too because they go in their head, they go, but grip is grip. Yeah. And that's not true. No. It's it's not. And the way in which you... Grip is a multifaceted thing. The, yeah. the representation is, I can hold this thing. But mm. this is not done with one muscle group. They're mm. both acting together in different ways to create it. Now you add rotation, extension, elevation, all these different things. Someone pulling on your leg at the same time. Your lats are involved now, but they weren't before. Like... It goes on and on, and that it's an important thing to know that you, you you did that so clearly, and it's it's so crucial. The mm -hmm. order in which you said those sleep number one, absolutely. That's not. It's, there's just absolutely no debate there, and it, it has to be accepted by people because mm -hmm. it's facts. All the good shit happens when you're asleep, from cognition, memory recall, muscle recovery, literally your ability to be present in a conversation or present in training. It all happens then. But the, you know, uh, stay up now, sleep when I'm dead mentality to get ahead is really mm. the worst approach of all because it keeps you further away from where you could be. But yeah. then within training, making it, uh, and I think that this is a hard thing to do outside of conversations like this is to help people understand that don't do this for a living, to see the values in things like that, mm. to train to prevent your body from getting hurt mm -hmm. not necessarily just train to get certain numbers higher exactly yeah yeah it's uh and, and and again this is more important than uh for your hobbyist and and guys that just want to spend more time i mean most of the people that you talk to who do jiu-jitsu they're hobbyists and they just want to spend as much time on the mat as they can and they want to do it for as long as they can i mean i'll, I'll add something on Something maybe uh, just because we're talking about how important it is about the sleep thing. 
there are some outliers out there, very, very rare, but there are some outliers who just seem to be able to perform on much lower sleep. But if you're thinking about issues with your recovery and you feel like your body's broken, it, it probably isn't you. <laughs> yeah, not you. Um, a lot of people that I do talk to who um, are unable to get enough sleep, and there are on rare occasions, generally it's not the case. Uh, generally, if you really focus and you can change your lifestyle around that kind of revolve it around getting a little bit more sleep but occasionally you'll find someone where i am not able to between the time i get back from training and the time that i need to get up from work i'm only ever getting five hours sleep i would gen i would seriously look at implementing some sort of midday rest into your uh schedule I mean, 10 or 20 minutes, something that I've been doing more recently. I've never been at one who's big into napping, but might do it. If, I mean, that's another thing that professional athletes are very good at napping, getting even more sleep in. I've never been super good at it, but recently doing a lot of NSDR, non-sleep deep rest stuff, which uh, has been... Do you use the online, like the, the vi guided videos and yeah, stuff Yeah, I have like a that. Andrew Huberman talking me yes. through it every step of the way. And, this uh, has been a game changer for me. Yeah, and, and, and because it's short, you can do 10 or 20 minute versions, but it seems to have a greater effect than naps do, yeah. um, especially for your cognitive function, because sleep isn't just about your physical recovery, it's about your cognitive recovery as well, which is going to have an effect on your physical recovery somewhere down the line. But more importantly, if you're doing jujitsu, you want to be mentally sharp, right? You want to learn things, you want to be yeah. able to switch on when you're training, you want to be fast to react to stuff. Uh, so... If you tell me that you don't have 10 minutes a day to do a non-sleep deep rest, a, a, essentially a, a form of guided meditation for the most part, uh, I pretty much fall asleep every single time, but that's okay. Uh, but if you don't have it's, 10 minutes of your time to do that every day or so, then then you really are a busy boy. I'm actually going to I'm gonna put that in the show notes because that was something that I was turned on to. His actual, the exact one you're talking about, the one yeah. that Huberman did. Um, and I, I also am not... I've I've overhauled my sleep over the years to really prioritize good sleep environment, good sleep hygiene, like just everything from what's in the bedroom, where, where it is to how you treat different rooms in the house for sleep. And it's been a, I mean, I'll be honest, it's been a four year work in progress. It's not easy to get good at sleeping, but if you're willing to invest your time in it, the payout mm. is instrumental, mm. but I've also never been a huge napper or i try and i go too long and then i'm tired and mm. i got turned on to this uh nsdr it is wild i mean you wake up kind of like you drank three or four cups of coffee mm. but it doesn't affect your ability to then fall asleep later and that's a game changer yeah because that... if if you prolong your actual rest because you've been sleeping in the day or your naps go too long then you're now you're robbing peter to pay paul and it, it's it's not as effective. How did you find out about that? Uh, I curiosity? think I was just listening to, to Huberman's podcast and he yeah. put me onto that. Uh, but yeah, it's something that, you know, especially when I do uh, the seminar tours that I do, it's very, very uh, tiring. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling city to city every single day. I'm sleeping for often very late, finishing seminars late, having to eat. Uh, everything's out of whack. And if I feel really tired and I've got a seminar to teach in a couple of hours, then... You know, even in the car sometimes, sitting down, lying down, doing 10 or 20 minutes of that. It's something that if anyone feels like, very simply put, if you listen to this and you feel like you're not getting enough sleep, then look into NSDR, which is non-sleep deep rest. Check it out. Huberman, uh, you can type in NSDR, Huberman or Andrew Huberman and uh, look up and research that and give it a try. You've mentioned in that, that little snippet there about uh, cognition. And I've always found this interesting with jujitsu because it, it appears barbaric to some degree because of the wrestling element and the fast pace and the tenacity. Um, but the more you get into it, you realize how technical uh, mm. it actually is and how much really it truly is a game of human chess. I mean, you watch two high level grapplers in a bout and it is, a really a math problem that they're solving at the same time that they're using all their their strengths whether they're developed or inherent and it's common that i i talk to practitioners and they have tons of books in the background and they play chess and they they are very mentally involved in their life mm. and i wonder like w with chess and jujitsu mm. is there anything that chess taught you about jujitsu or that jujitsu taught you about chess that that they've lent themselves to each other in a big way 
Yeah, great question. Oh, I love a man who brings up jujitsu and chess. Um, <laughs> yeah, so j- I mean, I think uh, I w- I've got into j- uh, chess over the last sort of four or five years. So I was I was training jujitsu for a long time prior to that. And I think when you get super into jujitsu, or indeed if you get super into anything, you start to see the patterns and the similarities mm-hmm. between what you're doing and basically anything else. So I never know when people say jujitsu is like chess. I think that might be just jujitsu people playing chess and thinking, well, this th- I can see the similarities here. But I also feel that, uh, and and uh, and you know, ha- you know how they say that chess is sort of an analogy of life, and they say jujitsu is an analogy of life, or wrestling is an analogy of life. But then I also feel that climbers would think that climbing's an analogy for life, and surfers probably <laughs> think that surfing's an analogy to life. And you know, I think yeah. that you could probably find that. But I genuinely do think that jujitsu is a little bit special and I think that chess is as well and in terms of uh, chess teaching me anything about jiu-jitsu or jiu-jitsu teaching me anything about chess I think it's just nice to see the principles um, of what you do in one field and you're able mm-hmm. to see the similar principles outside of that field because it's why I love analogy so much I feel like analogy is the greatest example of of you understanding a principle Mm -hmm. because you're able to express what it is through something that is different. So I love using chess. For me, um, I'm always thinking of chess stuff when I do jiu-jitsu and a lot of the time jiu-jitsu stuff when I'm thinking about chess, but usually the other way around. So because I teach a lot and I put a lot of thought into my teaching, so I love to try and find those connections so for example i'll give you some examples um an example is the when i teach a guillotine which is sort of the main technique that i'm known for and the one that i taught the most in chess you've got three phases of the game uh opening a mid game and an end game and they required the reason why it's important to know where you are in the game is because you have different objectives and different things to look out for um, and I break down the guillotine also into opening, mid game, end game, because you're looking for different things. So the opening is getting the hands connected around the neck, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. The mid game is getting your body into the correct position, and the end game is obviously the submission is the finish. Um, uh, another one, for example, in in chess, you trade down. So let's say you get a material advantage. I've taken out one of your bishops, and you haven't taken anything back of mine. Well, if you're not very good at chess like I am, what you do is you just trade all of your pieces equally. So when you get to the end of it, they've got no pieces and you've got one more. And uh, for me... You're explaining my entire approach. There you go. (laughs) There you go. And uh, so then when you take someone's back, for example, I say you trade down. So if we're able to isolate one of the opponent's arms from the back, we go from a two-arm to two-arm and we move to a two-arm to one-arm. Well, then I'm just going to sacrifice one of my arms, meaning that we finish with a no arm to one arm, and then I can finish easily. So we're trading down our position there. So like small little things that you might see in chess. Another one that I'm sort of thinking about and pondering about at the moment. I had to think about it last week and I wrote it down and it's something that I want to expand on at some point, uh, which is because people were talking about traps in Mm jiu-jitsu. And I think I'll tell you, I'll tell you why kind of final point before I go off too crazy on a, a Oh dude you can go off the cliffs. I'm like on for the ride cuz you're you're one you're explaining my horrible chess game in a nutshell and at the same time I'm seeing beautiful ways of jiu-jitsu techniques being taught through chess which I actually I mean I have a lot of notes on this now but yeah. just I like where you're going with okay. this. Take all the time you need. So what I think is nice about chess versus jiu-jitsu is that chess is a closed circuit it is uh there are uh, th- there are a lot of things that you can do but it's very much controlled there are at any moment you could t- you could tell someone the exact number of options that they have uh the exact number of moves that you can have and moving pawn to d4 is always pawn to d4 it doesn't matter if the person's bigger you don't get to move the pawn less because you're not as strong, right. stuff like that. So that's where the connection to jiu-jitsu and chess is very different. Whereas jiu-jitsu, it, there's an uh, infinite number of variables uh, and no move will ever be identical to anyone ever. Every single movement that you ever make in jiu-jitsu is a fingerprint that will never be seen again. 
in its identical form. It may look very similar, but it will never quite right. be identical. So there's a big difference. So it means that a lot of principles in jiu-jitsu can be very hard to break down and explain because of the huge variation and the open circuit that is the sport. So if you're able to find a connection between uh, uh, chess, which is a closed circuit, and jiu-jitsu, which is an open circuit, you can bridge the gap in a understanding principles. So, for example, someone was, uh, I think the way that this got into my head last week was someone was talking about setting traps in, I think it was maybe a podcast that I recorded a month beforehand, but it was in my head for whatever reason. We're talking about setting traps in jiu-jitsu. And it's certainly something that we all do. And the higher level that you do, the more you do it. I mean, a lot of people and white belts won't be setting many traps or not that right. they know of. <laughs> but when you get to very high level, setting traps is a really big thing. But if you try to explain, if you try to tell a jiu-jitsu black belt even to explain to you the, the principle, you know, concisely explain what setting a trap really means, they might struggle to really articulate that in a way that everyone would be able to understand. And then when I was rolling last week and I set a trap and I identified that that was what is what I was doing and immediately I started thinking of chess and how you can have different types of traps. So, for example, in chess, there are two main, the way that I look at it, and this is still something I need to flesh out a little bit more. First time I've spoken about it, I just thought about it last week. Or raw right now. Yeah, very raw, raw right <laughs> now. Uh, but basically... You have a trap, which is you're waiting for the opponent to put themselves in harm's way. So let's say we have uh, our bishop is iron down uh, a diagonal and our opponent makes a stupid move and they put their knight on the diagonal and boom. The, the bishop is the, the knight is gone. The bishop's taken it. Very simple. The, I'm thinking you, in, in my head, I'm thinking... Uh, just because we were doing this last week, but like if you're on on bottom and someone goes for like a Toriando pass, you can bait yeah. their sleeve and then drive it through as you rotate and sweep them. But you yeah. set that up, right? You anticipate that they're going to try to pass further. Exactly. You anticipate. You yeah. So the first trap is you wait for the opponent to step into the trap, mm -hmm. right? So very, very, very sort of the most basic. You, you, you make a hole in the ground and you cover it with leaves and the rabbit runs along and it jumps on the pile of leaves and into the trap it goes. That's a very basic one. The more interesting one and, and, and what I think is a really important concept in jiu-jitsu and it's a really fun concept in chess is focusing less on what the opponent is doing and more on what they're leaving behind, Right? So the idea in chess is, is that if you move that knight, most people, your white belt, so to speak, will go, that knight is now here. How can I get that knight? Right. What you should be looking at is that as well, but also thinking about the knight was here before. It's left its position. What has it left open? Right? So it's almost like the opportunity cost of a movement. Like if you are the one moving the night, it, you're talking about this from the other perspective, but if you're the one moving the night, yeah, that move that you did could have been a different move. And by doing the one that you chose to do, you've now created space or an opening in the space where it used to be. Potentially, yeah. So let's say um, you open the door, you open a door and you walk out. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to take you out, I sneak in the door that you just opened, mm. right? So, and, and, and the way that I thought of this, that this came to me when I was grappling because I was in a position and I set this trap, which was, um, I, can't, I can't remember the specifics of the position. It was an awkward position, but I was in a position where I was waiting for my opponent's arm to leave. Not because I wanted the arm, but because I wanted the neck that the arm was protecting. Does that make sense? Yeah, no. So, yeah, so totally. it's a, tr it's a, so two types of traps. One is to attack something as it moves or when it moves, and the other trap is to attack something that that movement has left behind. It's left exposed. 
So in the chess example, it would be to not take the knight in the bishop's path, but take the knight's previous space with another piece, leaving the bishop where it is, bearing down the gun, but you're you're using that slide in. Exactly. It's actually so, a really interesting approach. Yeah, so exactly. So so the knight's moved, but maybe that movement of the knight has given you a way to checkmate because that knight was covering the square that was protecting the king. That's an extreme example, but that's the idea. Right. So not just looking at what moves. When a hand moves to grab onto you, instead of wholly focusing on the hand that's grabbing you, where was the hand before? Maybe it was protecting his collar. And what has it opened up now he's no longer there? That's Straussonomics. <laughs> so, uh, look out no, I, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna try and I'm gonna flesh this out a bit more yeah. when I have time and I actually want to at some point put a post explaining these types of traps and there may be other ones that I haven't thought of yet but explaining these two different types of traps from showing a chess position and showing a jiu-jitsu position as well well it's an interesting it's an interesting comparison um I actually I do think that there is something there and I've I mean I've nowhere near as long as you right i've been doing jujitsu for five years i've been playing chess my whole life and i've actually nice. never thought not whoa whoa let me back up there yeah, i've yeah, been yeah, playing sure. chess my yeah, whole life yeah. but if we go chess.com right now i'm getting waxed by you I don't know it. <laughs> but uh i've been doing jujitsu for five plus years i've been playing chess my whole life i've never thought about it in mm. that way because as someone who's i would classify myself as a hobbyist who competes sometimes but as as a hobbyist that is what you look at. Mm. You look at the sleeve or you look at the hand control yeah. or the wrist control or you want the neck. Yeah. And so you're in, you're, you have their back and all you want is the neck and you're not paying attention to where their arms were or where their legs were. You, it, you're never looking at it uh, in, like in the past in that sense. And to the same fault, if all you do is attack in chess, you do peace exchange. Yeah, which is I get my ass whooped all the time because that's what I do in the beginning, not thinking much about it, mm -hmm. is I just exchange pieces for pieces because it feels like you're winning, mm -hmm. but you're not because they're setting up this much bigger overarching game and all of a sudden you're in checkmate and you didn't even realize it. And it is a conceptually completely different way to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm actually very curious to see when you... <laughs> when you iron this out, what else comes out of it? Because I feel like now just thinking about it, there's a lot of adjacent concepts like that. Yes. But yeah, the question are. is, how, okay, so how do you slow your game down as a practitioner to identify that? Or how yeah. do you implement that into your training? Because yeah. that is a, a very aware, super aware thing to do. Mm. Yeah, this is a really good question. So um, this is something that I've actually, the question that you've just asked me is something that I've been pondering on uh, recently because what I've noticed over the last um, couple of months that I've been training is that I've been thinking a lot whilst I'm rolling um, and coming up with a lot of ideas and concepts and things whilst I'm rolling, most about jiu-jitsu, but not all, <laughs> um, or how jiu-jitsu relates to other things. And uh, I think this was, so uh, prior to the last couple of months I've been, that I've been away for, prior to that I was, uh, so I did a seminar tour and I had a new seminar out for this year, which is a mount seminar. Um, so when I, the previous couple of months that I was rolling prior to going away, I was very, very heavily focused on training the mount position and being very analytical with what I'm doing because I'm sort of like, drowning myself in the mount as a position and the concepts to make my you know so, so i'm trying to learn as much as possible and refine how i'm going to be teaching stuff so when i whenever i was rolling i was just being very very analytical of everything that was happening but that makes sense when you're when you're doing that for jujitsu when you roll jujitsu and you analyze the jujitsu but the thing was i wasn't analyzing how I could improve my position or submission or stuff like that. I was uh, analyzing how I could best teach these principles. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, I'm not thinking about jujitsu because I'm not thinking about the doing of jujitsu. I'm thinking about uh, something adjacent to the doing of jujitsu, which is the articulation of how to do these techniques and these principles. And um, so I became aware that I was becoming more analytical and aware in, whilst I was rolling 
And then this is something that's continued since I came back from those, but no longer about the mount position specifically, but about other stuff. So for example, I was thinking and pondering about this chest thing about setting traps and when I was rolling last week. Um, and, and then when I rolled uh, another time last week, I was specifically thinking, this is really interesting that I'm thinking about so much. And I was like, writing notes in, on my phone in between rounds of stuff that I was thinking about and sometimes you don't remember it all because rounds could be long and you end up right. you know get someone's passing your guard and you forget about everything else now the question about how can other people do that I actually think it's really difficult and I'll tell you why because I think you need to have your jiu-jitsu on a level where you're able to so the beauty for about jiu-jitsu jiu for most people is that it's very meditative which is mm -hmm. when you're doing jujitsu, you can't be thinking about... Uh, I've talked the about this before. Everyone talks about it, right? Yeah. When you're doing jujitsu, someone's trying to choke you. You can't be thinking about uh, the argument that you have with your girlfriend. You can't, be you can't be worrying about the promotion that you might not be getting next week. And everything's very much in the moment. That's the case, I think. And I might be wrong. It might just be for some people, myself included. But I'm... If I had to hazard a guess, that is the case up until a point where your skill level is high enough that you can roll on autopilot and mm -hmm. beat most people. So when you can roll on autopilot and beat most people, you, you free up so much cognitive space that you can start really thinking. So to the point yeah. where I start to think that I have my best ideas whilst I'm rolling. <laughs> you know that's like uh, a complete evol it's like an evolution all the way through the end point into the next evolution. it's into the next one yeah it's like okay this has gone from some like a place where the focus is to be of no mind to yep. where actually i'm using this as somewhere to help me make ideas and be creative outside yeah, of jiu-jitsu you know that reminds me of uh when you're strength training uh -huh. i feel like in the early days of strength training you you try hard and that's yeah. how you get strong because you get under the bar, you shake your head, ah, smelling salts and you try hard. Then there's this point in your, in your strength career where you might be listening to like an analytical podcast while mm. you're in the middle of your set and you're actually feeling the closest you can be to feeling the fibers do the work mm. when you're doing the thing and you can focus on that. And it's a level of focus that is not available when you first start pursuing strength because you don't have that. It's like proprioception for the inside of your body. Like you just don't yeah. have that type of awareness yet. And, but uh, okay. But if that's true and I think you have a really good point, how does someone, despite uh, your tenure and despite that level of competition, what could they focus on to start to like just generalize an understanding of this type of mm. stuff? Yeah, I mean, just to find kind of top off what I said there, which is I think if I had to hazard a guess as to the mechanism of the that that what I'm what I'm going through when I'm rolling, I would assume that there's a change of the brain waves when you're doing jujitsu in the same way that I think uh, it's been proved like when you're in the shower, you have a change of your brain waves, which is why people have great ideas in the shower. Like gen genuinely, I think this is an actual thing. And you go and have a hot shower, go and have a long, nice hot shower. You have some stuff to think about. Stuff, stuff seems to be flowing. That's how it feels like me when I'm rolling. But I think maybe that's for everyone. But most people are using all of that <laughs> cognitive capabilities to go, holy shit, oh fuck, what this guy's doing to me? How am I going <laughs> to choke him and trying to think like that, you know? Um, in terms of how someone who doesn't, who isn't, uh, skilled enough and hasn't trained long enough to be able to get to the point where they're winning on autopilot and have this cognitive space to be able to analyze what they're doing i okay. think the answer is probably um either lower the intensity of your rolling mm -hmm. so that there is space for you to think more about what you're doing i think that if you're if your jiu-jitsu is not super good you can probably only think about jiu-jitsu so you're probably not going to be able to yeah think about other stuff but perhaps you can think more about your jujitsu than you already are by doing one of two things one slowing down the intensity in which you're rolling 
consciously and purposefully and intentionally try and think more analytically about what you're doing force yourself to do that even if it's at the compromise of your performance on the mats to a degree so for Mm. example a good a good example of this would be well you might not be able to autopilot smashing someone but you could probably autopilot being stuck underneath side control (laughs) <laughs> right that that's probably not too yes. hard for most people yeah i yeah. mean maybe not for a white belt a white belt of would not even have the understanding of jiu-jitsu on a basic level to be able to think about it in any way but right. if you're a blue or purple belt and have been training for four or five years if you get underneath side control on mount and you don't focus on consuming yourself with the idea of what you have to do next and doing it and instead think about what's happening, can I analyze this, what's my opponent doing, and just purposely trying to bring yourself into an analytical state, then that would probably assist with your comprehension of the situation in a grander perspective. The other way would be, um, I think, brainstorming after rolling. So what happened yeah. here, you know? So you roll with someone and you go, man, that was a crazy... Biz- it's something that we do in jiu-jitsu anyway, right? Like, oh, that was crazy. How'd you get that arm bar? And then they tell you about that. And then it gives you an opportunity where you're no longer fighting for your life to be thinking to about think what about. was going on. And and more importantly, to be thinking about something that just happened, not something that is hypothetical in history or in right. the future or abstract, but something that has just happened to you and being it fresh in your mind and being able to remember what's going on and then being uh, an, an openly analytical and having someone else there will be a massive help. Um, I think these are ways to try and be a little bit more, a little bit more analytical, a little bit more uh, in depth about your jujitsu without necessarily having 15 years of training behind you. Are, are you a fan of filming or training for the, for newer people? Do you think that that's an important thing to do? Uh, I don't think importance the right word. I think pr- probably very useful. Is it something that I've ever done? Oh, very, very rarely. I mean, a couple of mm-hmm. times, and usually just to tease my training partners about cool moves I've gotten with. <laughs> uh, but, but realistically, <laughs> realistically, the way that uh, uh, it, it's probably really good. It's probably really good if you have the time. But I think what most yeah. people would do uh, is they'll film their sessions, and they'll never look at them again. But I have a, right. I have one of my training partners, a student of mine, who fi- who films his roles a lot. And he spends time. He looks at it. He's super analytical about his jujitsu, and uh, it definitely can't hurt, and it almost certainly helps. So yeah, I think that's another great way of doing it is because you, you're reliving the rolling, but without having right. to worry about what you're actually doing. So that's probably a really good way of of having a similar effect. I I hate to to turn it into a little bit of like questions, but there are a few just questions that I'd love to answer. Or yeah, that's ask cool. You yeah, no before, we, before we jet here. Um, do you gravitate more towards spirituality or mythology? Oh, they're both the same thing for me, my brother. How oh so? yeah, spirituality and mythology. Oh, bro, if you want, if you thought I was excited about talking about chess, <laughs> no, well, I'm I'm looking behind you. I always like, you know, I I thought about bringing my bookshelf actually down yeah. into the background here, just because, I mean, there's so many interesting things here. But one of the one of the things like with chess. Chess and jiu-jitsu, we're talking about one of the parallels that I find really interesting, is you can find out so much about a person in the first 10 seconds of doing either of those things with yeah. them. You could yeah. be brand new in a foreign country at a cafe. Yeah. Someone could come up to you and say, hey, do you want to play a game of chess? Go, Absolutely. Yeah. And from how they open, how quickly they open, how they respond to your opening move, if they even did an opening move or if they just moved a piece, like all these things give you so much. The second you slap hands, let's assume yeah. that there's no belts on, there's no geese on. Slap hands, you know. Are yeah. they angry? Do they have animosity? Are they stressed out? Do they have an ego? Do they not care? Are they funny? Like Those things are instantaneous. And in other moments in life, it can take fucking years yeah. to figure that stuff out. You could spend 10 years with someone who's your best friend. You find that they've been stealing money from you. What? Yeah. Like, how did that slip through the cracks? But with these two things, granted, I, I think chess a little less than jujitsu in that if there's no skill set, that they just don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And there's not the physical element. But with jujitsu, there can be no skill set, but you still find out are they no skill set and actively mm-hmm. trying to learn, or are they no skill set and they want to try to beat you up? Yeah. And that goes back to um, with books. I love when people have books on display because it is a snapshot from how they're organized to 
if it's multi-level, if it's a, a horizontal bookshelf, if there's mythology, spirituality, is it yeah. uh, get rich quick scheme books, like whatever it is that's behind someone, it does give you a small <laughs> teaspoon into like how they think about life. What yeah. things are you consuming that help you, Dan Strauss, paint the picture of the mm. world that you see in front of you? Mm. So all of that to say, uh, spirituality and mythology. Yeah. I think that, uh, so I'm I'm big into mythology. Uh, there's very few things that I love more than mythology, to be honest with you. Uh, and I think a lot of people do see them as two separate things, but I'm starting more and more, especially recently, to see them as interlinked. Uh, the mythology is not just fun stories, but mythology is the way that we, they, they, they are stories that can be used by anyone at any time to understand the world around us and understand our place within it. So uh, this is very much, um, you could go down the route, like Joseph Campbell, I've got loads of Joseph Campbell, I've got lots of books, these are just some of them. Um, I imagine that it <laughs> goes it, like that. It kind of does, like goes all the way across, <laughs> oh, to be honest damn. with you. Oh, Hold no, on, I, let's I, get the, it, for it, the YouTube, it, it, let's it actually, get the it fall. Actually, it, continues the, it continues to go through for a lot. Uh, so I got about go. a thousand, thousand books in here and probably half of them are mythology books. <laughs> I love it. Um, but um, what what story in mythology? I hate to, to ask you for like a canon yeah. because if you're really in it, they all have meaning. But they're all different, you know. I is think there I something think, that sticks out as there's, like there's, that's there's not a single one. thing because you're like, uh, what's your favorite part of life? And you go, oh, I don't know about yeah, that. I what's mean, the, what's it. what's the favorite part of your psyche? You know, what's the favorite part right. of you know all of these different things? So I think that that that's something that I'm trying to look at less is the specificity of an individual myth that i just that just resonates with me oh mm -hmm. i like hercules because he's badass and he does all this cool shit and he carries a club and he beats people up, you know and thinking more of sounds the, like your instagram <laughs> yeah exactly 100 <laughs> percent. Um, don't get me wrong i do love it it's one of my favorite but exactly but getting more interested in in uh mythology and storytelling as a medium for helping us understand uh, nature, especially. So a lot of Joseph Campbell stuff, that's his idea. I can't remember the exact quote, but it's like mythology is the, is, is, is the bridge in the gap or helping to explain uh, our unconsciousness and our, or, 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 or something like mythology is the way to reconcile nature and human consciousness. Something like that. Super cool quote. Something genius. Something genius from Joseph Campbell as he is. I mean, the greatest, by far the greatest mythologist out there. If anyone is interested in mythology, then Joseph Campbell is sort of the man to go to. Um, it, uh, does it trip you out? I, I think about this a lot. Like our our entire life we've had an understanding of the cosmos to a scientific degree like there's yeah. just from when you're a kid you learn about the solar system you learn about you can decide if uh religion interests you and if that makes sense or if mythology interests you but to imagine it being alive at a time where you actually think the earth is flat and mm. that you'll fall off the edge of the cliff if you go that way mm. and to look up and to just not know, like to, to truly just have no conception about what you are. And then there's a couple people around town telling these stories mm. and you're going, oh, oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Like, does, what do you think about that? That always just blows my mind. Totally. It's hard to get into the mind of someone who lived, uh, you know, 3000 years ago. But uh it is we're we're but i think uh, who knows maybe we're inundated with too much knowledge these days i mean we have such an issue with what is truth yeah. what is real what is not real is this you know and i think people can get too bogged down in the scientific method as well which mm -hmm. is uh pe people look at science like a religion whereas science is just a way of like ha has something been proven and people assume that right. if it hasn't been proven it hasn't been it isn't true uh and don't get me wrong I'm I'm fully behind science, uh, but I think that uh, the mythology and spirituality are, are, are very closely connected, um, and they assist with each other for sure. Well, uh, then we'll close with something that we started on, which is extremely important, and that is PEDs. But, <laughs> but I know what you're going to say. Uh, but we're talking about a very specific type of PED. Performance enhancing uh, denim. Yeah, tell, you gotta <laughs> tell me about this. What are we dealing with here? Why is it is it the satire? 
Uh, in, in it, it probably but... started out like that, to be honest with yeah. you. What it was is uh, for a while, I was, um, when I sort of went super into the very put in the functional and functional training and I was like, well, I'm just going to train in what I'm wearing and I wear right. boots and jeans and a t-shirt. So that's what I'm going to train in. And uh, it wasn't something that I consciously did. It was just something that I, you know, it was just, you know, it, it wasn't something I did on purpose. I just did it. And, um, and, and then people started to pick up on that. I was posting videos training my <laughs> jeans and I continued doing so. And then someone messaged me. It was super hot. Like we moved into summer that year yeah. and people said, well, what are you going to do now? So of course I pulled out the, the Daisy <laughs> the Dukes. Yeah. The Daisy. <laughs> pulled out the jorts. And then, uh, and then that's kind of where it's been, but it's got to the point now where it's uh, no longer a joke in any way, shape or form. I train every single training session in the gym, in jeans, whether I'm recording anything or not. Uh, there's certain exercises that I might put on something else, but for the most part, I'm training jeans. Not only that, I feel legitimately stronger and more capable to lift in jeans than I do wearing anything else at all. Um, uh, a lot of gyms in the UK get very funny about you training je in jeans. I've been kicked out of some. So what? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wear, tra like I wear uh, normal tracksuit bottoms or pants, whatever you want to call it, like gym pants uh, to, to go to gyms. And I do not feel good in them. There's an interest in the psychological um, uh, phenomenon, <laughs> if lack of a better word, called enclosed cognition, which is essentially yeah. uh, your psychology and your mind will take on the attributes of what you're wearing, not what you're wearing, what you perceive your, what you're wearing to be. So a short example of this is hopefully before my internet doesn't cut out here. Oh, my, yeah. my, my um, uh, battery doesn't cut out. I'm on 5%. Uh, okay. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> okay, we're going to make it happen. This but reminds me of if you've never seen Arrested Development, uh, <laughs> yeah, Tobias yeah, yeah, yeah. is the yeah, never, you, a, you are the never nude of strength nev training. <laughs> the never nude of strength training. And uh, so, yeah, you know, it, th this enclosed cognition, the idea that whatever you wear or whatever you, un you whatever, attributes you attribute to what you're wearing by wearing that you will gain those attributes and for me jeans are hard wearing they're hard working they're for you know for doing heavy strong shit and that's what i feel like when i wear them so i'm all about the well, i have a knack for being weird and doing shit that guests do so i feel like one of these days you I'm gotta try it brother like find, find you some find you some stretchy stuff. jeans yeah. find you some stretchy jeans and do some squats or something. but you know what they're, they're actually again all humor aside you know like the semi-concrete powerlifting suits uh -huh. that people wear it's tautness right yep. i mean it creates stability so maybe that's a conversation I mean, for another time i mean but you i, could I be wear onto something i wear stretchy jeans so there's no tightness there i'll tell you what the, the original reason i actually remember that the original reason why i wore jeans is when i was bending horseshoes and when you bend horseshoes you bend them over your leg and yep. if you're wearing shorts or anything without any friction it slides off so I would wear because I so I actually bent a horseshoe at my brother's wedding many years ago. So yeah. I had my denim shorts under my suit jacket at the cer at the ceremony. You're never nude. This is proof. In take, life, take, take the trousers off. The 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 jorts are underneath, uh, and, wow. and and I did the bend. Yeah. Legendary stuff. Well, Dan, I want to thank you so much, man. My I pleasure, could, brother. This could be four hours. I mean, we only touched the tip of the iceberg on Absolutely. some of this stuff. So. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We'll have to do My it again pleasure, in the brother. future. 100% brother.